Okay, we need to move along. So next is going to be Skip Crilly, K7ETI from the Green Bank Observatory and Synchronized Multiple Radio Telescope uh, Microwave SETI. Take it away, okay. Skip. Okay, <clears throat> can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. And I can see your screen too. Okay, great. From beginning. From beginning. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, uh, yeah, I'm Skip Curley. I, I uh, work as a volunteer at uh, the Green Bank Observatory uh, for about five years, and I work on maintaining the 40 foot telescope there. So we've been doing a very fun project uh, since 2017 in uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, the idea is that individual radio telescopes are very sensitive to radio frequency interference. And um, so we've decided to put together this system of multiple telescopes where we put separate receivers at each location and run them independently. We don't communicate with each other. And we look over a band of frequencies from 1395 to 1455 megahertz approximately with 3.7 hertz channels. And the idea is to look for signals that are arriving on multiple telescopes, two or more at the same time on the same frequency. Um, the telescopes are, are a, a 60 foot dish in Haswell, Colorado, southeastern Colorado. It's an excellent low RFI site. Um, and that's run by uh, St Steve Plock, KL7IZW. I drive to Green Bank, where I work, um, on the 40-foot telescope, and I install my computer receiver um, and digitizer on that telescope and run that for a week. Now, I keep the New Hampshire telescope running while I'm down there for a week, start it up before I leave, and then I come back. Um, and then I post-process the files. So the idea is these files are independent and they store signals that are above, above a, a signal to noise ratio threshold. And communication signals could potentially be sought out in post-processing, given that there might be signals that are on a very close frequency uh, to each uh, telescope. So this is what it looks Skip? like. Yes. Uh, you have a little bit of popping on your microphone. So maybe you could just remove it. Move it from here. It's a little bit too close to my mouth. Right? Yeah, maybe, maybe move it a little closer, though. That's a little too far. Is that a little bit better? I think that's better. Try that. Try that's better. OK. So the idea is to generate an RFI filter that can reject out to a long distance with beam overlap. There's also a helpful situation because the Doppler shift is, is slightly different across the, the uh, pattern of the antenna of each antenna. So if you take into account the overlap of the beams together with the Doppler shift, which is greater than um, one bin, 3.73 hertz, about 15 hertz for the Doppler shift across the beam. This is an RFI filter that can reject to about 720,000 miles uh, before RFI starts to essentially be in the beam. So of course, there's always the issue of side lobes and other things that could occur. So we've been running this system since late 2017. Uh, we ran 135 hours uh, until February of 2019. Each of these lines is, is approximately two days um, of observation. And we started not running all around the clock. And then as we ended up, we, we started running it continuously. Um, and then we did a, a we finished up uh, accumulated 180 hours in April of 2019. And then in December of 2019, we were able to run three telescopes uh, together for about 4.6 days of combined pairs and about 1.8 days where Green Bank, Haswell, and New Hampshire were all pointing together. So it's a total of about 290 hours uh, of accumulated time total. So I'm going to talk about observations. Um, and before I uh, say anything more, I'd, I'd like to say that I'm a, a huge fan of multiple hypotheses and analysis of hypotheses relative to each other with Bayesian inference. So I'm not going to uh, 
hopefully say anything that will make you think that some of these observations might be a uh, extra terrestrial signal. So this is what we saw after 135 hours. There were seven pulses that were within plus or minus one hertz. Uh, this is right ascension around the circle. And uh, those seven pulses were as a result of the post-processing of all those uh, 100, first 135 hours of data. Now the first thing that I noticed, which really caught my attention there, is that two of the pulses within one hertz were on consecutive days in August 15th and August 16th of 2018. And uh, the other thing I noticed is that is that many of the pulses have high signal to noise ratio, well above the 12 dB threshold. So those are anomalies that can be analyzed statistically to say, is there something there? So more than just do we have signals on the same frequency, we want to know what is the spectra of the signal when these simultaneous events occurred. So I'll just, just maybe clarify that, that these represent pulses that were within plus or minus one hertz, exceeding the threshold in the same quarter second at each of the Haswell and Green Bank receive systems. So if we were interested in looking for a communication signal, we would say, okay, well, what, what do we have? Well, the data stores everything that exceeds the threshold across the frequency, uh, 1400 roughly to 1450 megahertz. And because the SNR threshold is quite high, there aren't that many events. There's about 10 to 20 events that exceed the threshold in a quarter second. And if there is a communication signal present, there is going to be probably some indications of something that diverts from the Poisson statistics that we would expect with this kind of a process. In addition, there might be high SNR. So the combination of SNR and small frequency differences can be used as sort of like a squelch in a radio uh, to say, okay, there might be something interesting here to look at. So um, this is what happened in the Green Bank data at the same time as the minus one hertz in that direction that I mentioned where the two right ascensions were overlapping. Um, there was, there was a, Okay, so let me explain this, this graph. This likelihood with an offset is a plot of all the data points that occurred. The, the, cl the cluster is the quarter second of pulses that occurred during that quarter second. The, the axis, so horizontal axis, is the frequency offset between two adjacent tones that occurred in that set of captures. Um, and, and so, there, there, are, there are normally offsets that are on the order of about two megahertz or so. Now the, the graph dips in the middle because we have to, if we're calculating likelihood, we have to multiply by the number of trials. And the number of trials increases as we move away from the offset. So the zero seconds, I, I'm sorry, I might have misspoken. The horizontal axis is the time offset uh, from the time that the simultaneous pulse occurred uh, the minus one hertz uh, simultaneous pulse occurred is the time offset. So there are these outliers that occurred slightly before the simultaneous pulse. So the zero represents the time of the simultaneous pulse. The, this represents about three or four seconds. And there's a table down here that shows the time below that. Um, so there are these outliers here that together we can calculate or extremely rare in noise. And um, uh, this gets my attention. The, the, other, the other raw data um, saved for the, for the Haswell telescope and the uh, Green Bank telescope um, for the other pulse uh, also had some in, unusual things. But this, this particular record had the most unusual set of of close frequency tones, 607 hertz, 339 hertz, uh, within 10 seconds. This is about a 10 to 20 year noise event that we would tend to see these close um, frequency spacings uh, within this time interval. Okay, so then April 2019 came along and then we have a, so here we have a pulse that was 5.8 hertz off in April 2019 between the two sites. And this had a very interesting spectrum. 
uh, at the two sites. So the green bank spectrum is above, the, the Haswell spectrum is below, and the 5.8 hertz is, is over here on the left. It turns out that, that the 5.8 hertz pulse that was present on both antennas had another pulse next to it that was very, very close and much lower than the two megahertz we would expect. There were also at each of these red pointers additional close tones that occurred and there was a set of close tones up here that were close to another set of close tones at Haswell, 1.9 and uh, 3.7, 3.8 kilohertz separation, which is also statistically very significant. This is a zoom on a has one of this Haswell pulse, and it has an offset of 1.66 kilohertz. So as an engineer who uh, has spent a lot of time building test equipment, I need to figure out what is causing this. So December 2019, we ran all three telescopes together. And this is a plot of the offset and frequency between pulses versus right ascension for all of the transits that we did during that uh, period of time of about five days while I was in Green Bank and Steve was operating um, Haswell and, and I had the, the New Hampshire telescope running. There, if we zoom in on this region we're interested in, this five hours of right ascension, <clears throat> there's, there's a collection of, of pulses down here in the, in the zero to minus 12 hertz that is, it, it appears to be statistically significant, uh, although there are other examples. But the interesting thing about them is, is the right ascension is very similar on all of them. So if we take the full 24 hours and then calculate the chain, the difference in right ascension for these pulses, and then look at how many are accumulated in a window or in a bin, let's say. So if we choose a small right ascension bin, there's a big spike of pulses at this right ascension in, in, this, in this bin. In other words, a group of pulses were, were very close together in this zero to minus 14 hertz range. Um, so which seems, seems kind of unusual. Uh, we can do some statistics and depending on assumptions, you know, you get some pretty small numbers because this is obviously a high deviation from the, from the mean we would expect um, at other right ascensions. So the idea is can we, you know, another idea is can we find any pulses on one telescope operating independently? So after I came home in December, um, Five I, minutes. Uh, okay, I, I ran a, um, an experiment to do the post-processing on the two orthogonal circular polarized received signals uh, on the antenna here in New Hampshire. And just as a starting point, and this is a 20 days, 20 transits, um, and I had some various RFI filters that I experiment with, uh, which of course can complicate results and, and you know is potentially a problem. But uh, the interesting thing is that there does appear to be some anomalous set of pulses, um, the larger dots are higher signal to noise ratio, um, in this region around 5.1 to 5.4 uh, right ascension and 0 to 14 hertz. And so the point is to continue looking at this and I'm improving the system to do that. So what are the conclusions? Well, based on this data, um, the noise hypothesis appears unlikely to explain data. Of course, there could be many other hypotheses and maybe I'm making a mistake on my noise hypothesis. Um, but the observed anomalies, uh, I think, compel continuation and, and looking at this and finding out what else could be going on. So I'm building two more telescopes on my farm that um, are gonna be hopefully around 28 feet diameter. Uh, one of them I'm gonna make transportable so I can move it some distance away from the farm and um, perform simultaneous nearby 24-7 uh, measurements. And I'd really like to encourage others to try this. Uh, it doesn't take a very large telescope to, um, to do this uh, test. So I'd like to thank Steve and, and Deep Space Exploration Society team. They operate the, the Blishner's telescope and 
Green Bank Observatory uh, as well, and family and friends. And thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Skip. Uh, Garrett.